I do weddings. Some of you know that. Some of you probably have been up here with me when I've done one. Tying the knot. And you don't, of course, just waltz into church and do a wedding. You plan for it. And in terms of the service, I tell every couple pretty much the same thing. I tell them 85% of planning a wedding is figuring out how to come in and how to go out. In the most common wedding service we do here, almost everyone does it the same way, what I call the traditional way. The guys, you know, having showered and put on a, putting on a suit, come out of this door over here and they walk to the front and they stand right there at the rail and they look to the back for the ladies. And then the ladies, after hours and hours of prep, come in, usually preceded by the flower girl and the ring bearer, or sometimes those little ones come right before the bride, but they come right down the center aisle, followed, of course, by the bride, who is escorted, usually by dad. Now, there are other ways to do it. I have seen the men come down the center aisle, followed by the women. I have seen the women and the men come together, the men escorting the women. One wedding I had, the men came down that side aisle, the women came down that side aisle at the same time as the bride came down the center. That one kind of reminded me of a football kickoff. <laughs> but one way or another, you get in. Then you got to get out. And in terms of getting out, there is no good way to get out of a wedding. The best way, I think, is to do this, is to have the couple exit, get mom and dad out, and then have a couple come back and dismiss the pews from the front. Now, this method is not perfect, because no method is perfect. If the couple doesn't greet people, the people they miss at the reception might be insulted or hurt. But at least this method employs peer pressure. This idea that, hey, people are waiting to leave here, so let's keep it moving. And most of all, it avoids that invention of the devil, the receiving line. When Frida and I got married, and some of you might have been there, it was 105 degrees outside. The church had no air conditioning. The church was packed. The tuxes were navy. And after the service, we stood outside and greeted people in the heat, sweaty, feeling disgusting for the better part of an hour. As person after person came through, usually someone only one of us knew, people that the bridal party didn't know at all, and they chatted and chatted and chatted. And Aunt Flora, Aunt Flora butted into line three times so she could keep chatting. And here's the thing, the receiving line it demonstrates human sin because it highlights a particular human sin, that of self-centeredness. Because what happens is this. Folks come out of the church, they make their way to the couple, and they chat, and they completely forget that there are other people back at in the church trapped in the pews. Trapped like rats on a sinking ship. Because we're getting to talk to the couple. It's our moment with the stars of the day. How lovely, what an exclusive little club. Let me tell you about Uncle Floyd. It'll only tell, take a minute. I've done this. Maybe you have too. But we've all been on the other end, right? Sitting in church, hoping that eventually we'll at least get to stand up. And funny how sometimes, once we get to the couple, we forget that there are still others back there. The greatest human failing, perhaps, is self-centeredness. And self-centeredness can breed an inability to remember the plight of others, and it can breed exclusivity. I got the bride, you don't. Okay, I've had some fun with the wedding receiving line. Hopefully I didn't spoil anybody's good memories of one of those. Right now we're in the middle of a government shutdown. And most of us go on through our days not thinking a whole lot about it. It personally had not affected me. If I hadn't seen it in the paper, I would not have known it was even happening. But of course, I read the paper, and yes, there's a tug in my heart when I read about people who aren't getting paid. It's a real tug, but, you know, I'm human. I don't know those people. And it's hard to remember them when I wake up in my warm house, cuddle my dog, grab my coffee, and start my normal day. But a few days back, I saw a post from Maggie, our own Maggie Tuferolo, 
who stood up here with me and with her husband, Coast Guard Lieutenant Junior Grade, Eddie Lazowski, good Mount Joy boy, and got married. And the post was an article that said, Coast Guard families encouraged to have garage sales to make ends meet during shutdown. Well, so much for ignoring what's not affecting me, right? Every year around this time, or sometimes in December, we hear John the Baptist screaming. And the people he really has it in for, the people he is really angry at, the really, really religious people. What was so bad about these Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, in one sense, not that much. Gerhard Krodel was one of my teachers. He was a world-renowned scholar who happened, as a 16-year-old boy living in Nazi Germany, to get pulled out of his high school class and almost literally thrown into the cockpit of a fighter plane. The Nazis literally came into his class, they looked at the teacher and they said, who are the smart ones? And that was it. By the way, he always said that he was only alive because he got sent to the Russian front. Bad planes, bad pilots, he said. All of his friends that fought against the other allies died. But he would look at these passages and he would say, don't be too hard on those Pharisees and Sadducees. Yes, the early church was really mad at them. Yes, Jesus disputed with them, but they were mostly good people. But I think John and Jesus were angry with them for precisely the reason that the wedding receiving line shows our human sin. They were self-centered, and on top of that, very exclusive. And they were using faith, and in a very real way, God, to support that self-centered exclusivity. To say, we are better than you, God likes us better than you, because we are more faithful. Religious movements usually start with good intentions, the very best. But what happens as we start to get organized and we put our rules together, rules that are supposed to help us be faithful and to bind us together, is that we create this world of us versus them. The ones talking to the bride versus the ones trapped in the pews. The one who gets his morning coffee unimpeded versus the one told to have a garage sale so she can buy some coffee. And good or not, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had done this, just like we Christians often do. The church, of course, has worked hard to coordinate the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus, but they definitely had a few different ideas. Otherwise, John would not have sent his disciples to Jesus later on in the Gospels to confirm that he was indeed the Messiah. My guess is Jesus was a little more peaceful than John imagined he would be. But the gospel is a word of inclusion. It is a word of love, and it's a word of love that says God decides and is in charge of who is loved. Even when we look across the room or across the world and say, that one is unlovable. The person following the gospel understands that we are to love all, even when we fail to do so. The person following the gospel understands that we are called to see the pain of others and respond, even when we are comfortable. And maybe the person following the gospel should say to the bride, it was a beautiful day, this was wonderful, but I'll talk to you later because there are so many people back there who are anxious to see you. We have trouble seeing beyond ourselves. It's human nature. But Jesus is always asking us to look beyond. And when we look beyond ourselves and share the love of God without concern for whether a person is deserving or not, it cleanses our souls like the chilly water of the Jordan, like the fiery words of a prophet, like it feels when someone shares the love of God with us. Beware of words and feelings and tendencies we all harbor that would divide. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus has been lifted. We are called to share his mission. 
lest we hear the scream of the prophet and realize he is pointing with good reason at us.